Good morning. My name is Bill Lepp and I am a storyteller. I am five-time champion of the West Virginia Liars Contest. I also served four years as a United Methodist pastor. People often ask me, how do you justify being a pastor and a champion liar? And uh, my answer to that is, most of the disciples, half of the disciples, were fishermen. So I think that proved that Jesus loves liars. Now, uh, Cuss Runner was a good old boy from long, tall mountain stock. He'd been a member of everything. He'd been a union man. He'd been a strike breaker. He'd been a Republican. He'd been a Democrat. He'd been a lion. He'd been a Kiwanian. He'd probably been a Boy Scout and a Girl Scout. I don't know. <laughs> Cuss always said that he joined the side that looked like it was going to throw the first punch. Cuss loved to fight. Now, for a living, he was a moonshiner, and he was a well-respected moonshiner in about an eight-county area where I first had uh, my first church. And uh, Cuss, um, the legend was, I mean, there was a lot of legends about Cuss, but my favorite story about Cuss was that one time he was in a bar, and he got in a bar fight, and the fella he was fighting with pulled out a six-shot revolver and stuck it in his face. And Cuss said, I didn't know what to do, so I punched him as hard as I could. And when I punched that fella, he threw his arm up in the air, pulled the trigger, and shot a hole through the ceiling. So I punched him five more times. <laughs> that was problem solving for Cuss Runner. Now, Cuss's wife was a woman named Helen. And uh, Helen, uh, you've probably seen this dynamic if you've ever been part of a church. Uh, Helen was the spouse that was always at church while Cuss was the spouse that was never at church. <laughs> Helen was, oh, I didn't matter what we were doing, if we were Sunday morning services, if we had a special Sunday evening service, a, a Wednesday Bible study, a cover dish dinner, a, a, a homecoming, you know, cleaning the church for spring cleaning. It didn't matter what we were doing. Helen was there, and Cuss was never, ever there. And after about six months, I, I still hadn't met Cuss, I, I got a call from Helen one afternoon, and she said, Preacher, Cuss is in the hospital. Would you go and pray with him? And I said, Sure, of course, I'll go do that. Now, we're Methodists, so she didn't ask me to save him or anything, because, you know, that's none of our business. Um, <laughs> but I got in my car, and I drove to the hospital, and uh, there was Cuss lying in the hospital bed. Now, again, I had never met him, but it was a small town. I'm just going to move this out of my way. But it was a small town, so, uh-oh. It was a small town, so, you know, he knew who I was. And I stepped into Cuss's hospital room, and the first thing Cuss ever said to me was, I ain't never had no time for preachers. And even though I knew I shouldn't, I immediately went on the defensive. And I said, why not? And he said, because preachers always feel like they have to have the last word. And again, I knew I shouldn't, but I went on the defensive, and I said, well, having the last word is sort of our job. And I think we both knew at that point that we had gotten off on the wrong foot, that this wasn't the direction we wanted our relationship to be going. And so I took a physical step back, and Cuss took sort of a mental, spiritual step back, and he looked at me, and he said, I'm 83 years old. I've had a liver and a... Uh, uh, what did he have? He had a liver and a pancreas transplant. He said, uh, they've taken three toes from diabetes, I have an artificial knee, an artificial hip, and I've had quadruple bypass surgery. He said, they've done all they can do to my body. He said, I'm still spry as a fawn, but they've done everything they can do to my body. I think it's time I started working on my soul. And after that, Cuss turned this corner. And he started to come to church, just like his wife. Anytime Helen was in the church, anytime the doors were open, Cuss was there. And it was an interesting thing, because even though I hadn't lived in that community my entire life, uh, you could tell that there were people who were suspicious of Cuss's intentions. You know, why would somebody at 83 years old who had been so mean and a bootlegger and such a sinner, what business did that person have coming to church? 
And I know that you either know people who think that, you know, the church isn't for that person, or you yourself may be guilty of wondering why would that sinner come to church and making that person feel unwelcome for getting what you already have. It's a funny thing, the way we are protective about the church sometimes, and we kind of push sinners out. So it was this interesting dynamic to watch some people welcome cuss into the fold and other people kind of hold cuss back. Because Cuss had wronged a lot of people, there was no doubt about that. But he really set out to right a lot of the wrongs that he had done in his life, and he was really making an effort to be a better person, even at that late stage in life. Now, there were some habits that Cuss had that were frowned upon, not just by the Christian church, but by most religious organizations worldwide. And Cuss wasn't going to give some of those habits up, and that's just how it was. And Cuss was never going to be able to uh, adequately describe for you how the Trinity can be one thing and three things all at once. Cuss was never going to be able to explain to you how Christ could be both 100% divine and 100% human. Cuss was never going to be able to explain to you the nature of sin. But I thought that that was okay, because Cuss was trying to go to heaven, you know, not Harvard. <laughs> and uh, he was really working hard. And on Sunday mornings, I'd be sitting in my office going over my sermon, not writing my sermon. I wrote those on Saturday night. And I would be in the office going over my sermon, and Cuss would come in my office door. He wouldn't knock. He'd just come in, sit down in the chair across from my desk, and he would proceed to tell me dirty jokes. And he had often taken the time to illustrate those jokes on 3 by 5 index cards. And he would share those illustrations with me as I was working on my sermon. Now, none of those illustrations ever made it into my sermons, but they were often good exegetical background. So that was cuss. And then I got called from that church, uh, and I moved on to another church about two hours away. And after I'd been there for about six months, I got a call, it was from Helen, and she said, Preacher, cuss up and died. Finally. <laughs> I never knew exactly what she meant by that, finally. Uh, but she said, he, wants you, he wanted you to come and do his sermon, or he, he wanted you to come and perform his funeral because he never could stand that new preacher. Now, nobody could stand the new preacher. That church that I was in was a small community, smaller than this community, and I hope I'm not stepping in on any toes, but I don't think I am. Um, uh, nobody liked that preacher because he didn't do visitation. And I think, especially in small community churches, we can forgive a lot of pastoral sins. Maybe your pastor isn't always on time to meetings. Maybe he or she doesn't turn in the paperwork they need to turn in. Maybe they're not that great of a speaker on Sunday morning. But if they get out, and do visitation, see the sick, see the homebound, see the people that can't get out. The church can forgive a lot of sins, and this guy just wouldn't get out and do visitation. On top of that, he wouldn't let Cuss tell him dirty jokes on Sunday morning. <laughs> so clearly he was not a trustworthy person. And so Cuss didn't want that guy to do his funeral, and Helen said that he wanted me to do the funeral. She said, will you come do his funeral? And I said, I will be glad to do Cuss's funeral. Now, that might seem funny to you that I would say I would be glad to do someone's funeral, but first of all, I think your pastor would probably agree with me, I would so much rather do a funeral than a wedding, uh, because they're so much less complicated. Look, this guy's not complaining, you know. Uh, and also, for whatever reason, uh, you know, my, my graces uh, tend toward, uh, when I was a pastor, I was better at end of life than I was at celebrations in life. I don't know why, but I was good at it. Uh, so I said I'd be glad to go on Duke Cuss's funeral. So I got down there for the service. You know, I'd been gone from that town not very long, six months. And uh, the church that this service was in wasn't any bigger than from that fireplace to, to the church there back to those bushes. It was a small sanctuary, and uh, it was packed. There were way more people in that church that day than I had ever seen before. More than on Easter, more than on Christmas. You know, there were a lot of what my buddy uh, Josh Goforth calls, uh, what's he call them, uh, uh, buzzard Christians. They only come out at funerals. Uh, 
And I mean, it was, it was, the, the windows were open and people were leaning in. They were cutting holes in the ceiling and lowering people down. It was very biblical. It was packed, absolutely packed. And I know why it was packed. It wasn't because so many people loved cuss. It was because so many people knew that cuss was right on that line. We didn't know which way Cuss was going. There was no way to tell whether Cuss was going to heaven or Cuss was going to hell. And all those people in that community who had known Cuss his whole life, they just wanted to know what the preacher was going to have to say at Cuss's funeral. And uh, I got up knowing that's what the feeling was. Now, I have never been the sort of preacher that preaches other people into hell at a funeral. You've probably been to funerals where the preacher says things like, you know, it's too late for him, and if you don't turn your life around right now, you're going to hell. I always told my congregation, if they want me to tell them to go to hell, you know, come and see me later. So, and I didn't know which way Cuss was going either. I mean, I know what the scriptures say, so, but I didn't know. So I stuck to those sort of middle-of-the-road scriptures that Christ has provided us. Um, even the workers who come late get equal pay. Uh, my father's house has many rooms. If you ask for forgiveness, you will be given forgiveness, right? There's always somebody, and don't look, but there's always somebody in every congregation who thinks it's their job to judge. They think it's their job to say who gets into heaven and who doesn't get into heaven. And that's not any of our jobs. That's Jesus' job. Jesus makes that clear, that it's his job, not our job, to judge who gets into heaven. But those people are always out there. Now, my father is a retired minister, and he says that there are two reasons people cry when they get to heaven. He said the first reason is you get to heaven, God, St. Peter, Jesus, whoever, opens up your checkbook and shows you how much you could have given. And the other reason Dad says people is cry is because they get there and there are people who aren't in heaven who we thought would be. And so there's a sorrow that those people are there. Now I think there's a third reason some people cry when they get to heaven, and that's because they get there and there are people there who they <laughs> didn't think were going to be there. My uh, grandfather died when he was 89 years old. And uh, I suppose he went to heaven. Uh, and then my grandmother lived until she was 104. So she lived, I don't know, 10 or 15 years longer than my grandfather. And uh, I think when she finally died and got to heaven, she said to herself, eternity starts now. And I think when my grandfather saw her walk in, he said, eternity starts now. So... <laughs> Some of us have this idea that it's our job to judge. It's not our job to judge. So I sort of stuck to those scriptures. And let me say, uh, this is where the story gets a little more preachy, if, you, if it hasn't been enough already. Uh, I think the biggest thing we do wrong as Christians, and I don't know, I mean, I'm not saying you personally, but the church as a whole, we are out there being against things very often. We are out there saying what we don't like, what we hate, who we don't like, who we think should change their lives. I think if we flip that around and talked about who we loved and who we, what we could do for people and how we could help people, I think that would turn a lot more people toward the church if we were out there doing things that helped other people. I remember when I was a preacher, that's when the Harry Potter books came out. And so many Christian people were against the Harry Potter books. You know, they said that, I heard a lot of Christian women, I, I, I don't know if they cared more and the guys just cared less or whatever it was, but there were a lot of Christian women who said, don't let your children read these books because they teach you how to do magic. And I know that those ladies weren't reading those books because those books do not teach you how to do magic. There's a kid with a stick with a feather in it. Now, first of all, you try and get a feather in a stick, and maybe you can do some magic, but I don't know. But he would wave it and say half Latin, half Hawaiian words, and the lights would go on and locks would unlock. That does not teach you how to do magic. But so many people spend so much time being against the Harry Potter books. And let me just say parenthetically to that also, when the, uh, when the uh, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey books came out, 
I didn't hear any Christian women talking about how bad they were. And I think that's because people weren't reading Harry Potter. Uh, but if we had channeled all that energy, instead of saying, these books are so bad, these books are so awful, don't let your children read these books. If we had turned that around and just shut up about it and gone out and fed the hungry and clothed the naked, how much better would we look? We're standing up talking about how we don't like a kid's book when people are starving to death. And the thing about Harry Potter, okay, just stay with me now. Harry Potter is a human. I don't know how familiar you are with the story, but he's a human being. And they go to a special school, but they go home for Easter and they go home for Christmas. So there's at least the sense that they're Christian. And if you hung Harry Potter on a cross, he would die. So people hate Harry Potter, but he's within the Christian world, and if you crucified him, he would die. You know who's far more dangerous than Harry Potter? Superman. Because Superman is from a different planet. And if he has salvation, then there has to be a whole other Jesus. And if you put a Superman on a cross, he wouldn't die. He'd just be bored. But we let our kids wear Superman underwear. So just think about that. What are we hung up on? What, what, what are we hung up on? Especially in these days, uh, you know, Cuss, before he turned to the church, uh, Cuss liked to fight. He liked to be against people. He liked to find a reason to not like you. And I've heard so many people say recently that America has changed in the last 15 years. And I think that's true. You know, I don't want to think it's true, but it is true. And I think the reason is because we are looking for reasons to not like other people. I don't care what news channel you listen to, whichever side you've decided that you're on, all we hear on both of those news channels, and I listen to them both because I'm in my car a lot, is this is why these people hate us and these are the things that they're doing to make your life not the way you want your life to be. It's coming from both sides. The right and the left is telling you that the right and the left are awful, horrible, hating people who want to take your lifestyle away. We need to stop that. We need to quit finding reasons to hate each other. Or we need to suppress those things, quit saying them out loud, and start finding reasons to help. If we want to be a church, if we want to be the people of Jesus Christ, you know, in the Beatitudes, look at the Beatitudes. We, we skip the Beatitudes so often. It never says in the Beatitudes, blessed are those who are right and in power. It doesn't say that. It said, blessed are those who, revi who are reviled for my name. You are blessed if people hate you because you love Christ. So if you hear somebody saying they're trying to take the church away, they're trying to do this, they're trying to take God out of things, then you're on the right side if you still love Jesus and you're still looking to love people. Quit hating people. Quit finding a reason to be against people and start doing what Jesus said to do. Feed the poor, clothe the naked, visit the sick. You do those things... People see you in the community doing those things, see you quit saying, we don't like this group, we don't like this group, and start saying, we love everybody. You might not win an election, but you're going to go to heaven. I don't think anyone has ever gotten to heaven. And Jesus, St. Peter, God, whoever it was, said to you, listen, um, you can't come in. You were too compassionate. You love too many people. I'm sorry. We can't have that sort of thing going on here. It doesn't happen. So... Back to cuss. Uh, I hit those verses, talked about judgment, kept it kind of middle of the line, because again, nobody knew which direction cuss was going. But as we were leaving the sanctuary to go to the graveyard, there was, I like to think, the dominant emotion was hope. Hope that cuss would get into heaven. But I think it was a selfish hope. I think we all wanted cuss to get into heaven. Because we knew that Cuss was the guy in the great class of salvation who kept the bell curve curving. <laughs> and if Cuss could get in, the rest of us had a pretty good chance. So we got in the hearses or the cars and we went to the graveyard. And uh, as I said, Cuss was a member of everything. 
So the VFW was there, and the Disabled American Veterans was there, and the French Foreign Legion was there, and the Shriners were there, and by the time that service was done, Helen had about 14 triangular American flags on her lap, and, uh, on her lap, and 177 rounds of ammunition had been fired. And then, it was my turn, and uh, I went to the graveside, and I said the Lord's Prayer, and I commended Cuss's body to the ground. And we went over to an open part in the cemetery, and uh, there was a guy there who had a cage. And in that cage, there were three white doves. And he opened the cage, and the three white doves flew out. And he said, now, those three doves are going to fly in a big circle around the graveyard. And they symbolize the presence of the Holy Trinity with us here today, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And we watched those three doves flying around, thinking about Cuss, where Cuss's soul was headed. And as they made a full circle, two of the doves started to come back down. And the guy said, now, the third dove will fly off toward the horizon. And that will symbolize Cuss's journey as his soul makes its final journey to its final resting place where his illnesses will be healed and his sins will be forgiven. And we watch that dove fly off toward the horizon. And just as it crossed the tree line, a great big red-tailed hawk <laughs> rose up from the trees, snatched Cuss's soul, and descended. And everybody looked at me. <laughs> like I might have something to say about that. Now I don't know where your preacher went to divinity school, but at my divinity school they did not cover soul snatching hawks. <laughs> and I opened my mouth. I was just going to start talking. It's the way of my people. I was just going to start talking until I said something useful. I opened my mouth and got ready to speak. And I remembered the first thing that Cuss ever said to me. And the first thing that Cuss ever said to me was, I ain't never had no time for preachers. Because preachers always feel like they have to have the last word. And I thought about that for a minute. And I think that, you know, when we celebrate Pentecost, what we're celebrating is that we got all these languages so that we could go and spread Christianity from person to person. Didn't matter what language you spoke after that. After Pentecost, people had voices that they could go and speak to everyone. I think maybe one of the voices we got at Pentecost that we neglect is the voice of silence. I think sometimes if we just shut up, we'll do more for Jesus, for God, than if we talk. And I think Cuss was talking about Pentecost when he was telling me back then that I didn't always have to have the last word. So I opened my mouth to speak. And I thought about the first thing that Cuss said to me, and I closed my mouth, and I didn't say anything at all. And I looked down at Helen, she was standing there beside me, she was just a hard, tough little country woman, and her head was down, and her shoulders were going like this, and I knew she was crying. And she looked up at me, and she had tears running down through her wrinkles, and she had a huge smile on her face. And she said, well, I'll be darned. I ain't never seen nothing like that before. And then in that good, hard, practical, mountain way, she said, well, there's plenty of food up at the house. Let's go put some coffee on. Thank you. Thank you. What a wonderful, refreshing reminder to uh, sometimes just sit there and hush up <laughs> and be the church that way. It could be much more effective. At this point in our service, we turn our attention to the table, where as disciples, we practice weekly the act of communion, coming together in union with the holiness of God. And we believe that Christ is the host and Christ invites all to come to the table. If you did not come with your communion elements and you would like to partake with us, we do have a basket back there on the table and you are more than welcome to grab an individual serving of communion. 
to prepare our hearts to receive this holy meal, we sing in the garden. It can be found in your chalice hymnal on number 227. We will sing verses 1 and 3. handed on to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body that is for you do this in remembrance of me In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us together today in your name. We humbly thank you for keeping most of your children safe and pray for those that struggle and need your strength during this difficult time. Your will be done. Amen. Usually in our worship service, like indoor in the sanctuary, we would share a time of gratitude before we collected our monetary offerings, just as a reminder that gratitude itself 
is the act of worship. And so today, I offer it to any of you who would like to share out loud a gratitude so that we all might recognize it and give thanks to God. Anyone? Everybody's a little shy at this point, so I'll give you a moment. I'm thankful for Bill's message. Amen. Thankful for Bill's message. Me too. I'm thankful for children who have joined us today. That's always a good reminder of a hopeful future. Sally. I'm, excuse me. I'm thankful for all the new faces and hope they'll be with us again. Yes. Come back if you are able. Yes. I'm thankful for a service I can hear. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> we can hear. <laughs> Are there any others? Thankful for cool temperatures. Thank you, God. Well, if you don't feel like sharing yours out loud, please feel free to write it on any slip of paper or on the cards that we have back there on the table, as well as share with us any information that you would like uh, as a member or as a visitor today. And so aware of our gratitudes and the one from whom everything comes, if you are able, let us stand and sing our doxology. chalice hymnal this is to the tune of lead on O king eternal let us sing verses one and three to our storyteller, Bill Lepp. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your special message and also your humor. It's good for the church to laugh and to laugh at ourselves a little bit. I think we take it all a little too seriously sometimes. So remember to have fun. Thank you also, Mary, Mary Lovell, for you're the main organizer, correct? Other organizers here? Raise your hands so we can thank you. Bonnie and Catherine and Peter. Thank Over. you. Well, thank you for organizing the Paris Storytelling Festival. It's such an asset to our community. And thank you for considering our church out here in North Middletown to, to offer this space today. 
and now receive your blessing. May God be with you and may God keep you. May God send the Spirit to shine upon you and guide you upon your way as you go forth to do the work and mission of Christ. Amen.